gamers, gals, non-binary pals. It's your favorite gambling degenerate, Stevie here. And we're here to rebuild the bankroll after I lost it all in roulette. It was it was very sad. We got a zero and a double zero on the first two spins. Anyways, MBT uploaded a video called Murder Your Darlings. And I want to give it a little bit of a watch. So let's see what this white boy has to say. But first, this video was brought to you guys by Imperium Duelist. Imperium makes some of the best Yu-Gi-Oh accessories and apparel, full stop. In fact, I religiously used their Cherubim oversleeves for over a year at one point. And speaking of accessories, we've come together to create the Hoppin' Around playmat. You're all my little drama frogs, and I wanted to create a piece of art that is actually some form of usable merch. It comes in two colors, monochrome and hot pink, which is my favorite color by the way, and I am in love with how they turned out, both the single and two player variants. Pick up a playmat, be sure to use my code Stevie10 on all products for their site for a 10% off discount, and be sure to tag us when yours comes in. William Faulkner, or uh, Ernest Hemingway, or uh, Arthur Quiller Cooch? Jesus, it's hard to source a quote online. What? Is the author of the 1916 work On the Art of Writing. In what has become its most famous what? quote, the what author are we doing? professes this piece of wisdom. If you hear... I'm doing the voice because it's a quote. Roll with it. Require what? a practical rule of me. I will present you with this. Whenever you feel an impulse to perpetrate a piece of exceptionally fine writing, obey it wholeheartedly and delete it before sending your manuscript to press. Murder your darlings. Why are we talking about some random white guy? Why are we talking about fucking writing fundamentals? What, what, what does that have to do with this? This is about Yu-Gi-Oh! I want to like normal summon Ash Blossom and like, I don't know, make up our own. This quote urges writers to reevaluate beloved, personally meaningful, and fun to write characters that ultimately do not serve a story. It asks authors to do the hardest thing imaginable, reconsider characters, events, and places they believe to be their best and kill them. I've never wrote a bad essay ever. I was truly the fucking goat. Uh, fun fact. On an unrelated note, Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring is the best card in Yu-Gi-Oh. It is. This video is sponsored by HelloFresh. Fuck HelloFresh. Hello I actually have a funny story about HelloFresh. Uh, Adam, keep this in the video. I me just saying like, fuck HelloFresh with like the advertisement. Fuck HelloFresh. Hello One of my friends asked me to be on this like HelloFresh program and he would like literally pay me IRL money to just use his code because if he got enough signups, the bonus he would get from HelloFresh would offset the money that he spent giving to people to sign up for the code. So I was just like, sure. I'll get it and then i got my hello fresh package in and there was no fucking meat in there out of like the four fucking meat dishes i chose there was just no fucking meat i actively felt pissed i was like they fucking scammed me out of like six dollars of top sirloin so fuck hello fresh i'm never getting sponsored by you guys again until you send me my top sirloin thank you very much ring is played in almost every single deck that's topped in the last five years of the game it's the most played hand trap in every single Yu Gi Oh format where it's legal with one exception that necessitates its use. Go to our wow. Yu-Gi-Oh! and you'll see Good players guard. bemoaning it. Go to pro players' YouTubes and you'll see them calling it S-tier. There's no question. If you want to win games, you'd better be playing the best. And the best is Ash Blossom. It is. Right? Good card. Today, I want to explore an alternative understanding of the card. Like the darlings that litter the pages of Awful YA, Ash Blossom has become somewhat of a comfort character within Awful Locals lists. It's included within uh, decks for a one, two, three reasons. special. A general vague sense that it's good, a strange feeling of compulsion, a mode of thinking that because it's in so many good lists, it has to be a good card, the fact that no matter what you're playing against, it always does something. But format to format, its applications change drastically, and a must play in one format may not serve your purposes in another. The funny thing is Ash Blossom actually kind of did service a fucking use case in Zodiac format. Like you would Ash Barrage or you would Ash Desires. It's, it's kind of funny how even in this example, Ash still is actually like pretty good and sometimes necessary. Like us not only to examine Ash Blossom's place in the current metagame, but also to identify a thought pattern that might be hampering your success as a duelist. What? It's time to consider murdering our darling. <laughs> I'm not cutting Let Ash. You, you can't make me. It's my favorite card. Patterns I'm talking about. I was pawing through Runic profiles last week. If you're unfamiliar, Runic is a deck that plays on a different axis than most Yu-Gi-Oh strategies. The archetype is a series of modal spells that can function either as removal or special summon a fusion monster from your extra deck. In general, wow. a deck that's composed entirely awesome. of one-for-one -one removal spells isn't a good call, especially when a card like Snake Eye Ash can garner six or seven cards worth of advantage. However, Runic's field spell, Runic Fountain, allows you to recycle Runic spells, 
complicating conventional card knowledge about removal. MST isn't playable in 2024, but an MST that draws you a card? Well, that's also something like else. banishes, Since which is like the actual important part. recycle cards a singular time, runic decks have to guarantee they're able to find the maximum number of runic spells in any given hand. As a result, they often max out on every runic card with any utility whatsoever, and sometimes ones without much utility at all, just for names. The result is a deck that bucks traditional understandings of deck building and plays a ton all but mandatory cards. Cards. Modern runic decks, runic sprite fur hire, bestial runic, runic generator, and runic goatee have a very inflexible main deck, usually with only about three cards total for non-engine. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Where the hell's runic synchro? Where, where the hell's the good deck? Uh, unless that was runic bestial, in which case I am a dumbass. What non-engine do you think they play? In the profile I watched, they played Ash Blossom. When they Yippee! revealed the card, good card. They said, you gotta. Why do you gotta? It makes sense on a very basic level. Ash Blossom is the most represented, and therefore the best, card in competitive play. You've got three spaces for non-engine. You might as well play the best possible card, but I urge you to resist that thought pattern. But it's Instead good! Instead of thinking critically about why you're playing an individual card, you're deferring to an understanding of play rates. Play rates of a card in completely different contexts, in completely different decks, alongside completely different main deck options. And again, the consequences for misapplying this slot are super high. This is your only piece of non-engine in the deck. It's gotta be good. Instead, I ask you to be willing to murder your darling. That actually is a, a very good point in regards to how newer players can look at like a deck list that may be like marginally outdated and just kind of take it as a law and then they just play very suboptimal choices. Like I was at Locals the other day and there was this one kid who was playing Labyrinth, he was picking up the deck and he was like, oh my god, like you're doing so well at this Locals and I was fucking <laughs> like 2-0 because I played against like Speedrun Cash Terror or some shit like that. And he was like 0-2, was like, how are you doing it? And I was like, let me see your list. And then like he showed me his list and like I'm like pawning through it. And I noticed he had the shufflers, like he had Mudor and Keldo in the main deck. And I'm like, oh, like why are you main decking the shufflers? Because spoiler alerts, the shufflers aren't actually very, very good in this particular format. They're good versus like exactly Fire King, but you're not gonna guarantee go against Fire King every single round. More often than not, people are just kind of playing pure snake. Some people are at this particular locals aren't even playing that much silent force. And he was just like, well, I saw a deck profile by like XYZ Yu Gi tuber and they were maining the shufflers so i gotta play the shufflers and that's sort of quote unquote outdated knowledge where card choices can vary from format to format or even like micro formats where people are still like trying to figure out what's more optimal and as time goes on people figure out that certain card choices are way better than others and blah 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 blah, blah, blah comparative to others that it really can harm your deck building knowledge and prowess because again if you're all you're doing is like looking at net decks it's not bad to get a start like net decking is objectively good and if you want to understand how to play a deck you want to understand how to like hop into a deck and you want like a good solid foundation like net decking is a great place to start but you shouldn't take a deck list that's maybe like three to four weeks old six six weeks old one to two months old and thinking like yeah this will do it examination of ash blossoms slot with a willingness to cut it it's very possible you'll realize that much of ash's strength comes from its use alongside a second hand trap and in a list with so few non-engine slots you're better off following dinkabui lead and playing an equalizer that might trade for more cards. It's very possible you don't play any non-engine at all. If Ash is just going to trade for one point of interaction, you might as well sub it out for even more runic spells that do the same but offer more flexibility for your linear strategy. It's even possible you do land on Ash Blossom. Maybe your worst matchup completely folds to it. I'ma be real, I was so fucking wrong about Branded being like a bad deck in this format because holy shit, why are people playing this dog shit, man? I wake up and go to locals and I see motherfuckers playing fucking branded silent voice, summoning a Jowgin off of their fucking Albion. This is like the stupidest shit of all time. Is this what Yu-Gi-Oh has evolved into? You're either playing this stupid goofy ass FTK combo deck, Fire King Snake Eye, or you're playing a deck that makes floodgates like Flu on Dereze or fucking branded. It's oh my god, I want to throw up. Whatever conclusions you draw, I ask you to do them without any presuppositions. Rather than just tossing out a you gotta, Here's an example of that thought process in action. <laughs> We're considering playing Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring in our deck. Let's begin by thinking about the use cases for the card. 
At present, it, the the Yu-Gi-Oh! is about as close to a tier 0 format as we have ever been. Almost any use of this card is going to be against a deck packing Snake Eyes, and probably Fire King. First up, conventional wisdom is that if you see a Fire King Island, it's a pretty good target for Ash Blossom. Responding to the island with an Ash Blossom prevents the destruction of a monster, which prevents access to Garunix, which prevents access to Kirin. However, this supposes they have no other access to the Fire King line. Many of these decks are on 3 Kirin already. It's just as likely that they naturally draw a Kirin as you are to draw an Ash. Even if this does prevent access to the Fire King half of the deck, you've still got to deal with the Snake Eye half, upon which you did not expend an Ash Blossom, and which is strong enough to facilitate its own tiered deck. Okay, first of all, Kirin is not the entire Fire King line on its own. Kirin is kind of just a fucking cult by the grave, let's be real. Second of all, better fucking draw it, by the way. If you draw a Wanted Engine plus Fire King line, I'ma be real. You probably won that fucking game. You can open three hand traps versus that deck, and it just would not do anything. You like Ash the Island, you imperm the Snake Eye Ash, you can hope to God and maybe Veiler the Diabell Star. Like, it just does nothing, because they're just gonna go into a fucking Charmer, revive your Ash Blossom, go princess revive ash ash send island summon fucking among us like oh my god it's so fucking jover wait did that one trigger if it's sent okay never mind ignore that last part i don't know send princess you get the fucking idea and you're down a card secondly what about original sinful spoils well this can cut off access to Ponix or to snake eyes depending Phoenix. on which half of the deck your opponent starts with but the deck's got at least six other ways to get to the snake eye cards and a number of ways to get to the fire kings as well ways that are now not vulnerable to ash blossom against the snake eye pure variant this card is also often just icing. You've got to contend with Flamberge, Whale, IP, and Princess, even without the Sinful Spoils. A lot of Thirdly, how about effects. the effects of the individual Snake Eyes monsters? These are just kind of bad card economy. As referenced earlier, Snash usually represents six or seven cards on its own. You're trading a card in hand for one half of this card's effects. You might expect Ashing, Snash, or Oak can cut off access to Flamberge, but as decks begin weaving Divine Temple into their combo lines, it is becoming ever clearer that that's also unlikely. All these use cases are fine, but hopefully you can see that they're very often anything but turn ending must plays. Frequently, the card has a negligible impact on the board state. Now let's talk about the downsides to playing an Ash Blossom. Firstly, and most obviously, is Hita the Fire Charmer. Every fire deck is Fuck already this playing this card. Holy it's a way shit. to climb through fire monsters that occasionally extends. It's a spellcaster for Selene, and importantly, it's massively punishing if you're playing Ash. In a best case scenario where you are able to Ash Blossom and opponents must resolve effect, the monsters remaining on your opponent's side of the field can be linked into Hita, summoning your Ash Blossom back on the way to an early Promethean Princess. The fact that Princess is fucking 100% generic is the most heinous shit of all time. I fucking hate Princess so much. Why couldn't this be like two fire monsters? Or at least like one monster including a fire monster? Or something like that. Why is it just two effect monsters? You can just make this shit with a fucking pile of bricks and a burrito. Like, goddamn. Secondly, if we're in a tier 0 format, you can expect as duelists were during the UDS Invitational, players may be playing Crossout Designator. If they're on three Crossout, your opponent will have just as many chances to find this card as you will to find Ash Blossom. This negates the effect of Ash Blossom, of course, but unlike its partner in Called by the Grave, it does not banish the card. As a result, an opponent who is playing this card can punish an Ash not only with their existing combo, also game-winning extension via the Hita line. Thirdly, often makes your second hand trap worse. Even in these what? videos I've shown you extolling the positives of Ash Blossom, the duelists let slip that it's a powerful card when it's paired with another high impact hand trap. This makes sense. A number of formats have top decks that are incredibly resilient at playing through a single hand trap, but fold to two in sequence. Unfortunately, giving access to the Hita line often gives your opponent the ability to play around the second hand trap. Free extension may net your opponent a princess or even a flamberge through Divine Temple, both of which contest an in hand Nibiru. If it's turn two, Hita may be the difference between a Link 3 like Selene that can demand a response with an access code threat that Princess couldn't. The knowledge that Ash Blossom is no longer in play may embolden a duelist to make the decision to commit to a high impact fire king island line that loses to very little outside of ash blossom instead of a comparable line that loses to more generic options hell maybe they can even make it to Appalosa. so what are you gonna do to be fair your opponent does kind of have to just draw a hand that beats two hand traps i'm not saying it's impossible that is, i'm not saying that fire king is not a deck that could just be like ha ha, ha normal summon ash oh shit i think i broke my water bottle 
Or special summon Diabelle Star. Uh-oh, that's two hand traps? Anyways, Princess Among Us? Like, just win the game on the fucking spot. Because holy shit, that deck is so ignorant. But what I am saying is that sometimes, again, your opponent does have to draw a hand that can play through two hand traps that are specifically designed to stop them from extending in any capacity. Like, sometimes if you've got pocket kings, you've just got to go all in. And if your opponent has aces, then you're just like, all right, man, we did all that we could. <laughs> I'd like to conclude on this. I'm not asking you necessarily to kill Ash Blossom, to remove it from your decks and laugh from atop a throne of contrarianism as soon as I'm done with it. I'm asking you to consider the above discussion and determine if it's worth playing in your deck. Jesse, for instance, describes it as the fourth best hand trap, but guess what? He's playing the other three already. It's gonna make the cut. Rather than just putting it out to pasture or jamming it in your 55, what I'd like you to do is start engaging with your deck choices using this mental model, interrogating every slot in your deck by examining its use cases, its downsides, and how it meshes into the larger context of the rest of your strategy. Most importantly, be ready to buck unscientific, vibes-based deck decisions like, you gotta be prepared to murder you your to. darlings. All I'm gonna say is that when Rarity Collection 2 comes out and QCR Feet Ash comes out, you better be playing that shit in your deck list, or I will hunt you down. Anyways, let me know what your favorite Ash Blossom is, I guess, in the comment section down below. That's gonna be it for me. I'll see you guys in the next video.